Father, I thank you because I've come to know that it's by the ministry of your word that you distribute resources. Therefore, I receive that which is mine by the hearing of faith in the name of Jesus. Blessed are my eyes for the see and my ears for the hear. And therefore, my heart understands in Jesus' name. Amen. Say hello to your neighbor as you grab your seat. All right. There's some people have been doing summer travel, have been? And for scarcity. Amen. All right. So we get into the thought for today. Whatever part this is. Amen. <laughs> All right. So we have been dealing on the subject of counter-deception, as we call it, and originating from the scripture, Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. Uh, of course, first emanating from Matthew chapter 7, in terms of how the enemy operates, and letting us to learn that we have a strategy in God, that the strategy in God for those who understand indeed that they have been sent a sheep in the midst of wolves is that they need to be wise as a serpent and, and harmless as a dove. Hallelujah. Preach to your neighbor and say, be wise as a serpent and be harmless as a dove. And we have been dealing with certain principles around what we call serpentile grade wisdom. In other words, exhibiting a dimension of wisdom that would enable you to survive in the midst of wolves. Not just survive, but to thrive. Not just thrive, but to influence and change the culture. That is what we have been called to do as little livings expected to live in the whole lump in wherever the Lord has planted our feet and in the garden where he has placed us to the glory of God. And so we have dealt with thought level cognitive ability as part of that strategy, understanding the place of weakness and how it creates the potential difference for the flow of the power of God. We've understood the power of patience and we are on um, on the principle of the seed, and I called it sweat the small stuff, when God has shown you the big stuff, hallelujah, and he shows you the big stuff, he's not expecting you to sweat the big stuff, praise God, <laughs> he's expecting you to sweat the small stuff, the little insignificant things around you that are already present within your environment, to begin to wield the power of action on those things. In other words, take, begin to take steps from where you are, hallelujah, and begin to plant that seed now, today, for the expectation of the harvest that he has in store for you, hallelujah. So that harvest, that vision starts with planting a seed, hallelujah. Amen. Though your beginning may be small, but your latter end shall greatly what? Increase. So you start small, but you keep your eyes on the big vision. Because that vision is the sponsoring thought, as we began to speak last week, that begins to give birth to action. And we started looking into Luke chapter 16, and I hope to close on that this morning. And how Jesus... Um, gave us a parable of these unjust steward who found himself in a fix. And in finding himself in that fix, we looked through that scripture and we saw that he had a thought that was sponsoring his action and the thought was that I cannot dig. And in fact, another translation says, and I'm too proud to beg. Hallelujah. So because he could not do those things, those thoughts were the sponsors of his action, and that action essentially was to what? 
to begin to give discounts, basically using what he has in his immediate environment, what he could lay hands on, the things that he could do, began to give discounts to the vendors of his boss, you know, in exchange for goodwill, in exchange for favor. Hallelujah. And at the end of the day, the boss admired him and said, this guy is really smart. He was admired. He was commended for his action. And Jesus said something. And this is where we are linking the serpental wisdom with the principle of the seed, that the, 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 the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. And he said, you have to learn from this principle. Praise God. In other words, those guys know how to survive, how to come out of tight boxes. Hallelujah. Amen. So as we started to say that the thoughts, the thoughts he was thinking is essentially the seed that needs to be planted. The action in itself is just giving a body to those thoughts. Hallelujah. So the action in themselves, as it were, is a strategy to accomplish an end goal. Are you following what I'm saying? It's a strategy to accomplish an end goal. And the strategy can be very varied. Hallelujah. Someone else can think those thoughts and take a different strategy. Amen. So learn from this. Praise God. And this essentially, if I may detour a little bit, is at the basis, fundamental basis of the doctrine of faith. And I think I mentioned it a bit, you know, last week. Hallelujah. The thoughts or the sponsoring thoughts are really powerful. They are the, they are the same power. It's what really creates the action. And so if you have thoughts, if you have visions that are vibrating at the same frequency of the thoughts that God is thinking towards you, are you following? You are then in faith. It's called the righteousness, which is of faith. You have a right standing with God. And at that level of faith, you must understand that you are laying hold of the most potent driving force that you can find for your life in that time, in that instant, in that season. Are you following what I'm saying? And nothing can oppose or withstand it. Praise God. You may face the lion and, you know, the bear and the Goliath, amen, and Saul. Praise God. But at the end of the day, you sit on that throne. You keep your eyes on that vision. So the journey may not be smooth. Are you following what I'm saying? And it's no time to give up or be weary in, 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 in doing good. Are you following what I'm saying? For in due season, you will harvest. Praise God. So tough times or obstacles are not necessarily a witness to the fact that you're on a wrong path or that you should give up. Praise God. But you tenaciously hold on to the word of God, knowing that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Hallelujah. Praise God. So the bear, kill the bear. Kill your lion. Kill your Goliath, praise God, but don't kill Saul, <laughs> praise God. That's a lesson for another day. That's a different sermon. <laughs> don't kill Saul. Saul is sitting on the throne, praise God. That's a sermon for another day. Hallelujah. Amen. And I think we talked about it during patience, Abby. Yeah, 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 yeah. Amen. <laughs> praise God. This is the patience, what the patience of the saint can accomplish. Hallelujah. Amen. This is the God kind of faith. And again, it links us to the first principle we learned, thought level cognitive ability. Amen. It all starts right there in the mind. And the visions of God for your life can come in different forms, in different dimensions. Are you following what I'm saying? Praise God. It can be in casual conversations. It can come while you're reading the scripture. Something is just amplified by the Holy Spirit and it comes into your heart. 
It could be in conversations. It could be that you dreamt a dream and it was reinforced as you woke up. You couldn't resist the thought and you just know this must be God speaking to me about the next phase of my life. It could come from anywhere. Are you following what I'm saying? But what must happen is that it must be consistent with the pattern of God laid out in Scripture. Are you following what I'm saying? There must be a pattern. There must be a framing. Amen. In scripture, you must find a pattern. So you don't just follow and move after those, those thoughts as it were. You must find that there is a principle here. And very importantly, find the thoughts and the words from the logos, from the scripture. Amen. That can transform into your confessions, the things that you then wake up and you say to yourself and reinforce to yourself that is consistent with that vision that you're looking at. Hallelujah. For by faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So framing happens first. Right in the beginning, Genesis chapter 1, we saw God speaking. What he was doing essentially was framing, framing the things. Amen. And you can't speak without thought. You know, words come out of thought. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So there are thoughts that, 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 is, that is forming, as it were, or sponsoring the things that you are saying, is, is, is backing the things that you are speaking to life. And as you speak them, you are reinforcing them in the natural realm. You are framing things. Praise God. Amen. Speaking is very powerful. You start to put a frame to it. The Bible makes us to understand that what was happening there was actual creation. Indeed, praise God, even though nothing was on the surface. Hallelujah. But he was creating. He was framing. That's the power of communication. Communicating the vision. Reinforcing it to yourself, to your environment, and to your world. So that everything around you can recognize and like I've said before, speaking is the first, as it were, closest thing to, you know, to substantiating that something exists. Are you following what I'm saying? In the realm of the thought, it's still invisible. But by the time you start to speak those things, it is the first, closest thing to substantiating or proving that something exists. Amen. So as it is in your mind, you start to frame it with the words out of your mouth. So even in leadership, it is often taught that you communicate consistently the vision. Praise God. When you are doing that, you are framing. You are framing a culture. You continue to speak until you understand. It gets into the mindset of the people that you're leading. Are you following what I'm saying? Next time you're sitting down and you're a product lead or something and you're speaking to your team members, understand the power of speaking and framing, framing their consciousness, influencing their thought pattern. Are you following? So that they can begin to see as you are seeing. Amen. It's as it were, subconscious programming. You are literally directing their minds towards a goal and a direction. And when you say anything, I've completely digressed, praise God, God will help me. When you say anything not consistent with the vision, you rebuke it. It means I say, no, 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 we don't do it this way. Praise God. Amen. Hmm. Hallelujah. I was in a board meeting yesterday, and one of the directors um, at the meeting was speaking about a process within the organization, you know, just as it were, coaching the CEO. Process within the organization and the fact that at some point they decided not to gather, to speak. In other words, to communicate 
around the ideology governing that particular process. Are you following? And so you just say, oh, we know it, let's just do it, you know, just send emails, blah, 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 blah. They said after about three months or thereabout, they said he told his lieutenant, they said, we have to gather again, we have to come back and start gathering and talking about it. You understand? Because he understands the fact that he was saying, look, as other people are joining in and all of that, there are some things they are bringing to the table that if they knew, it wouldn't even cross this table. So we need to come together again so that in communication, they will understand our ideology around how we do this particular thing within the organization. Praise God. Framing. Framing. Hallelujah. Praise God, somebody. Amen. So not until Genesis chapter 2, you start seeing God giving a body to the things that he had framed. Formation started to happen. So it starts from the mind. You speak those thoughts and you start to give formation. Formation is that you start to act. Just like the unjust steward, he started to take actions. By virtue of the thoughts he had thought to himself, he took action and he wasn't looking for anything outside. He looked at what do I have? What kind of leverage do I have? So the seed, the opportunity to act is always available around you. Amen. What you are looking for in Sokoto is inside what? Your Sokoto. So look around you. The opportunity to start to plant those thoughts as seeds is there within your environment. Hallelujah. Amen, somebody. Amen, somebody. So let's open Luke chapter 16 and take a step further this morning. Glory, hallelujah. Amen. Let's look at verse 9. Glory to God. Amen. Sorry, sometimes I'm not used to it. Uh, please, my, my frames. Apologies. All right. So very powerful. Thing Jesus is saying here. It says, and I say to you, make friends for yourselves by what? The unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. Yeah. Glory to God. Make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon that when you fail, they may receive you into everlasting home. What is Jesus talking about here? In fact, Jesus himself to a degree demonstrated this. The word when you fail there, in fact, figuratively implies the succession, as it were, of life. In other words, when you run into trouble, when a disaster may hit you, when you find yourself in a fix, like this unjust steward who found himself in a fix, where there was an appointed date, as it were, that he would give account, and it was clear that he had been unfaithful, and so he was going to be fired. When you run into trouble, praise God, they may receive you into an everlasting home. Praise God. When Jesus failed, technically speaking, 
who will say I blasphemed. Amen. You took upon all your failures on the cross. Are you following what I'm saying? Uh, in fact, he was mocked. Uh, you are the healer. You are the savior. Save yourself now from the cross. It was as it were the end of himself, his ministry. Disciples deserted him. Hallelujah. Figuratively, this guy is ending up a failure after all said and done. Praise God. <laughs> but the Bible talked about Joseph of Arimathea. I want you to follow me very carefully this morning. And another guy named Nicodemus. These were men of means. You know how the Bible described them? He said they were secret, secret disciples of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Mm. They were secret disciples. They didn't follow openly. And in John chapter 3, we could see Nicodemus coming to him by night. Are you following what I'm saying? They couldn't associate with him publicly because they were afraid of the Jews. But secretly, they were his disciples. In other words, they were learning from him. Maybe they had more secret meetings with him than we even know about. Are you following what I'm saying? And as it were, you know, almost in my Holy Ghost common sense, is that it's possible Jesus <laughs> would have even prepared them and said, look, I'm going to die and all of that. I want you to get my body, you know, and put it in a nice place. Praise God. These were men of means. Amen. I'm just using my sanctified common sense. Are you following me? Praise God. These were men of means who had the authority, the leverage to go in and speak with, uh, with uh, what's his name again? The, the pilot, you know, of the day and say, give us his body. And he said, okay, you can have his body. And they prepared that body, scented it and kept it in the tomb. Hallelujah. Amen. Somebody say he had friends. Mm. Make of yourself friends of the unrighteous mammon. What does that really mean? You know, in my sojourn corporately, I have seen men of means, men of capacity being discussed. And in the midst of that discussion, as somebody is admiring certain qualities, Another person is bringing up the fact that, oh boy, if you see and you know the kind of deals with them do. Hello? In other words, these guys are not righteous. Like, they bruise some people. Some of, let me say one of them, like they say, is, is now podcasting, as they say. He's opened a podcast now, right? And you are seeing people on different sides. People say, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, he also was a monopolist. Blah, blah, blah. You know, I sat in a meeting many years ago, and this man himself is an, is an influential man. He, he actually owns one of the banks. And he said in that meeting, he said, he said do you know how many dead bodies <laughs> were, uh, okay, you all know who I'm talking about, so not the banker, but you know who, who is podcasting, Abby, is social media. So I, he said, do you know how many dead bodies where, how did he put it, in the wake of Dan Gote, like in his rising, do you know how many dead bodies? When it means dead body, it means, you know, businesses that have been crushed in the wake of his rising. Are you following? He wasn't saying in a bad sense. He was an admirer. Do you understand what I'm saying? But he was trying to say within the context of the conversation that, look, don't just think that this business you are trying to do, you are just going to, you know, um, it's just, it just comes easy. Do you understand? Like, it's a brutal, you know, environment where you have to fight. You have to fight and win. So you find people who are saying good for him, good for him. Even on our men's group, Abby, a lot people say good for him. It's good that karma. <laughs> so the men said, please, this karma, <laughs> let, let this karma not karma. Please, this is nonsense karma. We need, we need this refinery to work. Is this not the time for any karma to be catching? You let that karma move. <laughs> so people are saying, karma has caught up with you. Praise God. 
So then I say, please, 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 please. Let's postpone that. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. And several examples like that. But you must note something. And you see, I've said this several times. And in fact, it was supposed to be the last part of this series. But I just really wanted to close it. And that's, that's the thought that in every darkness there is light. You know I keep saying it. Amen. And when you think about darkness, don't think about it in the, in the, in the way you just think about it. It's dark. Praise God. Darkness is that light has been perverted. When Jesus is speaking about darkness, it just means that there is light here, but there is introduction of perversion that has made it darkness. Praise God. So he said, if the light that is in you is darkness, do you understand? It's a light. You are walking in the light, but you will stumble. Are you following me this morning? Praise God. So there is a light. There is something you can learn. What he's saying here by making friends implies two or three things. I'll speak to them. First is that you learn. Anywhere you see a quantum generation or mobilization of mammon, unrighteous mammon, there is a light there that you can learn from. Praise God. After all, he's asking us through this parable, he's saying, learn from this servant. What principles can you pick from him? And we are seeing that he was operating the seed principle here. Are you following what I'm saying? That I'm expecting a harvest, I'm expecting a harvest, but I have to do something now. I have to plant the seed now. Amen. So it's not enough to be expecting, expecting, expecting. Praise God. A scripture in Proverbs says, much talk tends towards what? Poverty. But the diligent hand, are you following? Will make rich. Praise God. Do something. Amen. It's the work of your hands that will be blessed. Stop dreaming. You've done enough dreaming. Are you following what I'm saying? Look around you. How can you start to plant that dream now? Is somebody hearing me this morning? Wherever you see value, as it were, gravitating towards Understand that there is something to learn there. Learn from the unrighteous mammon. Mammon in itself is not righteous. It, it, it means wealth that, as it were, is not in service to God, is not sponsored by the kingdom, is not in service to the kingdom. These people don't recognize God. They don't. Do you understand what I'm saying? Praise God. So it's, it's, as if it's further qualifying, they say unrighteous. That thing you will call and say is, 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 is not righteous. Praise God. <laughs> it says there's something to learn there. Hallelujah. You have the righteousness which is of faith. You need to know that you have to be what? Harmless as a dove. They may be harmful, but you be harmless. But the serpental wisdom you need, you can glean it from there. Are you following what I'm saying? Amen. Mm. Am I speaking to somebody? Amen. They were there for Jesus. These were the people as it were, who had an understanding. They were influential men. Joseph of Arimathea, a man of means. Are you following? These guys are the typification of what Jesus called the scribe who is schooled in the things of the kingdom. Are you following? Because they were scribes. They, be, they belonged to the Sardarian, as they call them. Amen? Sahendrin. Praise God. The council. 
Amen. But they were secret disciples. So scribes who were being schooled in matters of the kingdom, they said they will pull out of their treasure things old and new. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Amen, somebody. Glory to God. There's another man that I've talked about, but it, 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 it requires going back there. The man called Zacchaeus. Amen. This man exemplified this principle. Zacchaeus was a man of means. Amen. And he had one goal in his mind. I want to see Jesus. Are you following me this morning? I want to see Jesus. This was a publican. The one that the, 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 the righteous men of those days will look at and say, this one is a sinner. You understand? Do you know they call Jesus a friend, right? Of publicans and sinners. And they were asking his disciples, how can he, claiming that he is of God and is one with authority trying to school us, how do you, teaching righteousness, sit down and be making of yourselves friends of publicans and sinners? It was one of the things he was accused of doing. And he himself said, he said, the son of man came eating and drinking. <laughs> He says he's a glutton and a friend of publicans. <laughs> <See us. laughs> Glory to God forevermore. But look at this right here. This man, Zacchaeus, as it were, a Jew, but called or referred to as a backsliding Jew. In other words, he was a publican, a tax collector, um, who had gotten authority from the Roman you know, empire of the day to tax his own people to collect taxes from them. Amen. And for that, they hated him. I hated them. Praise God. But he had one goal. He said, I want to see Jesus. And in spite of his limitations, are you following? The Bible said that he was a short man. And when he saw that Jesus was coming and there were many people around him, he said to himself, I will go and climb a tree. In other words, nothing will stop me from achieving my goal. So if, for example, he was reporting to a master and the master gave him an assignment and said, go and see Jesus, that is your assignment, Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus could have come back to the master and reported to him and said, I could not see Jesus because I have a valid reason. I am a man of small stature. Right? At least you can see I'm of small stature and this guy is surrounded by a crowd. There is no way that I would set my eyes on him. And he could have given that excuse. But the reason why this guy was so wealthy is that he was a man that was not given to excuses for not getting his goals achieved and done. Are you following what I'm saying? That is what it means by being faithful with the unrighteous mammon. If his master was one that was dealing in the unrighteous mammon, praise God, he wouldn't come back with an excuse for why he couldn't get the work done. Are you following what I'm saying? He was intelligent enough to find out which path is he going to walk through and went to position himself. He humbled himself despite his wealth. Are you following? And despite his stature and despite the possibility of being mocked by people, he could not care less. Are you following? He humbled himself considered himself of no reputation. Yes, I am rich. I am of no reputation. And he did what? Humbled himself unto, not unto death, but unto climbing on the tree. Are you following what I'm saying this morning? Unto climbing on the tree. And he sat there, positioned himself that I will see Jesus. And despite the fact, do you know, 
that the people who were taller than Zacchaeus, at the end of the day, Zacchaeus had a better view of Jesus than those who had the capacity to see better than him. By climbing the tree, he became taller than every other person and had a more excellent view. That's why he was head and shoulders above them. Mammon, where you see Mammon, understand that there is diligent work going on there. You can be laughing at Dangote and say he has turned to a podcaster. Do you know how much work these guys put into their business? Talk about anything we have done. We will say, Murphy, this one, that one. Regardless or whatever, do you know how much? Do you know the kind of visioning? To put that kind of, do you know that place is multiple times bigger than V? Some of you don't know. To risk his entire net worth on a vision. His net worth on Forbes is what? $13 billion, $20 billion. Risk the entire net worth on a vision. Does that sound like the guy who went to a field, saw a treasure, sold everything he had to buy that thing? No matter where you see darkness, if you see the mobilization of value, learn. I've used Tinubu to preach several times. I'm not a Tinubu, I'm not a Batified person. You understand what I'm saying? But somebody will say the reason why one of the contestants eventually didn't make it was that he couldn't wait for his time. You didn't hear what I said. Those who are conversant with politics will understand what I'm saying. Praise God. After four years, you were already organizing to replace your guy. And that one had to beg because he had the money. He had to beg and then look for other people to come and support his ambition. And since then, they, they became enmities. Are you following what I'm saying? If he had just waited patiently, perhaps it would have been him and not Yaradua. Are you following what I'm saying? Praise God. But in what his age, just sat down. Patiently. Amen. <laughs> there is something to learn. Oh. Praise God. Hallelujah. It, what Zacchaeus did showed his mentality and how he thinks. Go the extra mile. If I need to humble myself, I'll humble myself. But that I won't achieve my goal, I will achieve it. I need to climb a tree, I'll climb a tree. Amen. And when Jesus saw that, that structure, what I would call that, that structure called Zacchaeus, Jesus looked up at him and said, I must come into your house and eat sup with you. Do you understand what I'm saying here? Ah, uh, people are following after this Jesus, but this Jesus followed after one man standing on a tree. And said, I'm coming to your house. Perhaps there are some people there who had been begging him, come, come, come to my house, come to my house. <laughs> he saw this man. And said, I'm coming to your house. Praise God. So at the end of the day, Zacchaeus reaped significantly more than what he bargained for. All he wanted to do was to see Jesus. But look at the quantum harvest that this Jesus came into his house to sit at tabernacle and gist and Talk with him. And Jesus invariably is telling us and showing us his mindset. Praise God. Learn. Learn. 
from the unrighteous mammon. What kind of harvest is that? So it's possible you get way much more than what you even bargained for from the very beginning. This man had a vision, went every extra mile to ensure it was achieved. And he got much more than what he bargained for. Jesus came into his house. That looks like what Jesus himself was saying in John chapter 15, which we're breaking down in the last series we were teaching. Praise God. Me and my father will come. You will know that we are in your abode. Are you following what I'm saying? That if you obey my commandment, in other words, you put action behind the instructions I'm giving to you. Praise God. And perhaps that's another thing you must understand. A God-given vision, it's not just a vision, it's an instruction. Do you get what I'm saying here? It's an instruction. It's instructing you. Hallelujah. Do I have people like Zacchaeus in the house this morning? Am I speaking to some people this morning? Is that someone who will banish any excuse that he's still giving for why he's not moving forward? Is that someone here ready to humble himself? That humility. Hey, like I've preached several times, that humility is an easy yoke. Oh. Are you following what I'm saying? Is a yoke, but it's an easy yoke. Come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, for I will give you rest. Bring your yoke upon me and take my own. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. He said, for I'm a man who is meek, meek and humble. So that yoke he's talking about there is the yoke of humility. Are you following what I'm saying? Yoke of humility. Praise God. Swallow it. Whatever you need to do, swallow it. <laughs> and when I say swallow it, just swallow that big spit. You understand? <laughs> Praise God. It just reminded me of when DDK was teaching one of the triangles and how, how many remember? How the Lord told her, they tried to rebuke her and said, go back, go and, go and do this to your father. And as the father was, she was just like, <laughs> <laughs> almost like, even not for God though, but <laughs> hallelujah. Amen. Humility. Humility. Humility is a strategy for lifting. Praise God. For some people, the barrier you need to cross to the next level is humility. There is a humbling act that needs to happen, and then you see yourself on the other side. All the burdens, the things you thought were just weighing you down, just find that it's lifted. Praise God. Consider yourself of no reputation. Praise God. Hallelujah. Am I talking to someone this morning? Amen. For some people, it is this same mammon. Hallelujah. That is a hindrance between you and the next, and, and, and even just planting the thought. Are you following what I'm saying? Praise God. Because you, are, you have put mammon, you by yourself, you've put mammon between you and your next level. Praise God. Amen. Like I often tell a lot of people, I say, well, you are not doing anything. But there, there, there must be a support system somehow. Just sponsoring your life right now. Are you following? You are breathing, you are living. Amen. <laughs> you have clothes on your back, you are living somewhere and all of that. 
there is, there is, a, there is something sponsoring you. So why are you there saying that you don't have anything to do? You've not found a job. Have you gone out to volunteer? Uh, no, I interviewed there. The money is too small. The money is too small. Praise God. And so that mammon is, is, is an hindrance between you and an opportunity to start to plant the seed and be faithful in that which is another man's. Are you following what I'm saying? It's too small. You don't have anything to do. You rejected it because it's too small. No savings is too small. <laughs> but after you are leaving that job interview, you are going urgent to K, urgent to K, urgent to K. Praise God. It can't take me home. Go and try first. Amen. Let, let the heavens know that you tried. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. It is in your action that help us would come. You see, some of you are waiting to see the provision before you move. Hallelujah. You are waiting to see the Red Sea parted before you step in. You are waiting to see the Jordan parted before you step in. But that's not the principle. Walk, step in first. And see the God who parts seas, part the sea. Make room and make provision. Are you following me this morning? Amen. Remove mammon. Step in. Step in. Grab the opportunity to begin to sow the seed. Are you following me this morning? Glory to God. And Jesus said, was speaking in this same narr narration, and when he was speaking to he that is faithful in little, what did he call little? He said, faithful with the unrighteous mama who will give you true riches. Faithful in that which is another man's who will give you your own. So that is what he referred to as little. That's the context of little. Little as a seed. Plant it, walk it. Praise God. So faithfulness with the unrighteous mammon. Listen to me. Some of you will work with organizations or with bosses who, as it were, are ruthless. Are you following what I'm saying? You may even know that ah, before we got that contract or got to sort some things. You see, you can witness unscrupulous things. It's called unrighteous. Is that same money from that contract, eh? That they used to pay your salary. Are you following what I'm saying? Amen. He said, be faithful with the unrighteous mammon. Not just the unrighteous mammon entering your pocket. Like it or not, many of you, you don't. Oh, yeah. you are laughing. You don't know what your, what your bosses or board members are doing to get the unrighteous mammon. Do you understand? Some people... Some people are even working in businesses that they're using to launder money. Are you following what I'm saying? And is this laundered money they're using to pay your salary? Are you following? So is unrighteous mammon is entering your pocket. <laughs> Praise God. And when you look universally at the, at the global flow of money, you just know that one way or the other, one mix, one mix, one way, sha. Praise God. <laughs> The person that sent you or wired you some money, you don't know where it came from. Praise God. But you give glory to God. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. No, for real. Amen. Ah. Even if you sacrifice to idols, praise God. If you give thanks, you sanctify it. Are you following what I'm saying? Okay, some people didn't get me. All right. Your religious mindset is setting. <laughs> I mean, I don't eat uh, sacrifice to idols. Uh, 
Praise God. <laughs> the one you are buying in, they do you know what they are doing. <laughs> Just give thanks. Asking no question. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> For conscience sake, give thanks. Are you following what I'm saying? Give thanks. Hallelujah. It's part of the power of thanksgiving. And give thanks for all things. There are people who have things, they, they don't recognize, they don't give God thanks for it. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't give God thanks, praise God. Because it's going to shine on the wicked and on the righteous. The wicked will not give thanks. But you as a righteous person, you have to give thanks, praise God. Hallelujah. It's a demonstration of your faith. Hallelujah. Amen. So be faithful. Be faithful. Be faithful there implies that treat it like your own. Have an ownership mindset. It is not mine. I am not vested in it, but I will work it like I would like another person to do in my business. Let me tell you something. Hello, somebody. Mm. When Jesus is speaking here, you know, sometimes you may think about it in the sense of um, maybe it's a reward system. It's not as though a reward system, technically speaking. When he says that, you know, if you are not faithful, in that which is my whole will give you your own. You understand? Like in, in that sense, do you understand what I'm saying? He's speaking to a principle of life. Amen. That men in themselves will not give you your own. You don't understand. Uh, the seeds that you plant, watch the seeds that you plant. Are you following what I'm saying? Watch the seeds that you plant. For whatsoever a man sows, he will reap. What are you sowing? in that which is another man's today. Amen. You would reap. Praise God. So some people need to repent, Abby. Amen. Some people need to repent. Hallelujah. The unrighteous mammon entering your pocket. Are you faithful with the, the, the judicious use of it? Glory to God. This is a foundational, fundamental principle or logic of how God thinks and does what he does. Praise God. And ultimately, he sold his son, Jesus Christ. What Jesus did there was so that he can bring many sons to glory, so he can be the firstborn amongst them who are what? Sanctified. Do you follow me this morning? Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Mm. Amen. Praise God. Just give me three minutes very quickly. Amen. Because I've seen a few things going around. And saying that, I just want to end on this note. Jesus is the firstborn amongst them who are sanctified. And thinking about it, it's the same principle. Amen. In the end of where I'm going. Hallelujah. Listen to me. There are all kinds of things, you know, to you expose yourself, YouTube everywhere. Amen. Look, if anyone here, for adventure, in your scanning the internet, especially YouTube, because that's where I came across and I was just like, okay. Amen. And you have been burdened that there is one cause on the firstborn. Please. It's, it's false doctrine. Are you following what I'm saying? 
praise God, is doctrinally, it, it doesn't balance. So free your mind. I, I, I'm the first son, right? And I used to feel like, oh, maybe there's something. Amen. Like, okay, well, okay. Well, as long as, until the Spirit of God opened my eyes. Hallelujah. So yes, you see patterns. Amen. So Jesus Christ is the firstborn. Doesn't mean he's first or what? I mean, what? what? Amen. <laughs> eh? <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. Let's call him the second Adam. That was the first one that messed up. And he's the second Adam. Hallelujah. It's a simple principle. Hallelujah. So get out of the shadows and get into the reality. Praise God. Amen. So yes, there's Ishmael. First born, Abby. The blessing was not ring. And then Isaac, right? The blessing was upon Isaac. There is uh, Perez and Zerah, you know, the one that came out first, put a red cord, but the second one came out first. Hallelujah. Uh, there is Esau, right? And the first and Jacob, the second. So everything is looking like the second. And then Jacob was going to bless the sons of uh, Joseph. And he placed uh, um, Ephraim or towards the right and placed... No, placed Ephraim towards the right, placed Ephraim on the left. And Joseph, though blind, praise God, crossed his hand and put the right hand blessing on the second son. And Joseph was angry and said, my father, not so. Joseph said, I mean, Jacob said, let it be so. Praise God. And all these things have spurred a lot of, are you following? Praise God. But the reality we have come into, when you say you are born again, what does it mean? Ah, uh, you didn't get it. You've been born a second time. That is a first born after the flesh. Praise God. The blessing is not, you've been born again a second time. If you are born a second time, the right hand blessing of the Father is upon you. I'm not talking about physical things here, yeah, manifestation and then, you know, all you know, kinds of redemption and special prayers, no. Praise God. How can one born of God still be tied to some bondage and... See, if you think it, as a man think it, so is it. If you accept it, fine. Are you following? Praise God. Hallelujah. Maybe it's because of the way we say born again, born again. It has become a noun. So people even say, I'm a born again. You know? Except <laughs> a man be born again. Nicodemus said, would I go into my mother's womb and be born a second time? He said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Praise God. You have been born a second time, not of corruptible seed, but of the incorruptible. Ah, come on. Hello, incorruptible. I are still saying there's some corruption there. 